Namu Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambu Dasa Namu Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambu Dasa Homage to the Blessed Noble and Perfectly Enlightened One Namo Sadanto Suchedo Ye Olahudi Samyao Samputoshi Namo Sadanto Suchedo Ye Olahudi Samyao Samputoshi Wushang Shen Chen Wei Miao Fa Bai Chen Wan Jie Nan Zao Yu Wo Jin Jian Wan De Shou Chi Yuan Jie Ru Lai Jian Shi Yi Supreme and Wondrous Dharma, Subtle and Profound rarely is encountered, even in billions of eons. But now we see and hear it and accept it reverently. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. Shifu Shangren, Gobe Shishong, Taja Omitofo, Venerable Master, Dhamma friends, welcome to our Sutra lecture today. My name is Hung Shur. Today is Sunday, May 22nd, here in Queensland, and it is Saturday, May 21st, we're into Gemini, uh, back in California. We're going to be explaining the last two verses of the Ascent to the Palace of the Suyama Heaven chapter, chapter 19 of the Flower Garland Sutra, the Avatamsaka Sutra. So let's uh, secure your tray tables and fasten your seat belts. We're about to take off here. Um, and we'll begin by requesting the presence of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, the Flower Garland Assembly. Furthermore, we would like to acknowledge that the Kombomeri people of the Ugambe language group practice their spiritual connections to land, to living beings, and all creation in this location here for thousands of years. Today we acknowledge them as the traditional custodians of this land, and we express our gratitude as we share this land today with sorrow for the costs of the sharing and with hope that we can move to a place of justice and partnership together. We acknowledge their wisdom and their elders past, present, and emerging, and acknowledge all First Nations people whose sovereignty was never ceded. And uh, yesterday, here in Australia, we had a change of government, and people, uh, the, the new newly elected Prime Minister, uh, Anthony Albanese, uh, gave his acceptance speech, and the first thing he did was acknowledge country. I was really gratified to see that, that that is truly the way it's done and uh, in, in public gatherings like this and so happy to 
also adopt that habit. I think it's a noble one and a great uh, elegant one and appropriate, it's righteous. And when I'm back in California at some point, I'm going to do the same. So welcome again. Uh, you can see my desktop. The, the reason why I uh, used, chose this as our backdrop for today is because we're finishing the ascent to a, a palace in the heavens by the Buddha. The Buddha's been invited by the king of the Suyama heaven. He's the king of the devas. He's the boss. He's number one big, big deva, Mahadeva in the Suyama heaven, which is one of the heavens in the desire realm, according to the Buddha's way of looking at things. And after inviting the, the Buddha and making ready, getting preparations ready, giving him a, a place where he's going to sit to speak the Dharma that he wants to teach here, um, the next thing the Deva does is kind of surprising to a lot of folks. He, uh, uh, he kneels down and puts his palms together and he tells the Buddha about his own personal history with Buddhas, that this deva has lived a long time and he has welcomed 10 other Buddhas to this very same palace. So that's the first order of business after getting everything ready, all the preparations. And I think that's so interesting. The, uh, first of all, that a deva is speaking the scripture, right? The sutras given to the mouth of a, of a god, not the Buddha, not a bodhisattva, but a, a deva, someone who's still in the realm of mortality, still on the turning wheel of samsara, but he gets to, to welcome the Buddha and, and one chapter of the sutra comes out of his mouth. Um, that's interesting. And he says something, the, uh, the, the boilerplate part, the part that gets repeated over and over again, the refrain of the verses that he chants. He's, he does some spoken word poetry here. He says, Shi gu zi chu zi ji xiang. Thus, this place is the most auspicious of places. This is a lucky place. This place has good qi, good energy, uh, he says. I'm going to switch there. You can see me here. So he says, this place is the luckiest of places. This is the most auspicious place. And you think, yeah, hosting the Buddha is a pretty auspicious thing to do. There's no shadows there. There's no darkness. There's no uh, nastiness, no affliction, no trouble. No trouble in mind, no blues when the Buddha's around because he, uh, with his light and with his virtue and with his goodness and his kindness, you just feel invigorated and fresh. And it's like the dawn, the dawn of the first morning of the world when the Buddha is there. So. That's why this place is the most auspicious. So I thought, yeah, let's, of my various uh, stories of monasteries, we're going to continue. I thought, here's an auspicious place. For me, not, not the most auspicious, but for me, this is an auspicious place because why? This is my deck where I live here. And nature is in its prime here. Although uh, Australia has not a very good record for preserving their species, there's lots of species going extinct here. We lost another mammal forever, the last one of its kind. I didn't get the name, a kind of a bush rat uh, winked out, out of existence, never to return just this last week. But where we are here in the hinterland of the Gold Coast, uh, although humanity is uh, evident, uh, still, there are, you can see on my deck here, cockatoos and lorikeets and turkeys and the gum trees. And they are, to this day, much as they have always been, uninterrupted. For how many tens of thousands of years, uh, these species and creatures have been uh, abiding and thriving. And they are. Uh, they're doing really well. So. Uh, the fact that we've got national parks on, on two sides and the ocean on the other side means that, that uh, the air here, uh, there's something quite wonderful about the air of southeastern Queensland, that it's, it is pollution-free. 
I mean, there's not a lot of industry to begin with, and the ocean breezes are uh, steady and fresh, and we've got all this lovely vegetation. So, 事故此处最吉祥 The Buddha is talking about, or the the Deva who's saying this is talking about、uh, his palace in his heaven, because the Buddha is coming. But if you refocus the lens, you could just say that、uh, the planet Earth potentially could be the most auspicious if one particular species would chill. That's the human species.、Um, our record for destroying the systems of the planet is horrendous. And we may, we may indeed find this planet unlivable、um, in our lifetime. But here in the Gold Coast of Queensland,、uh, the the size of this continent is the same, pretty much the same size as continental United States. But the population, 24 million, is the population of Taiwan, and Taiwan is about the size of New, New Jersey, so <laughs> a little bit bigger. But、uh, We've the least population density here, so、uh, the wildlife has a chance. So、uh, anyway, that's so. What is auspicious? Auspicious is when you find a planet with water. First of all, drinkable water, potable water. That's the rarest of the rare.、Um, scientists can correct my、uh, correct my statistics, but something like. 95% of the water on planet Earth is undrinkable. Why? Because it's in permafrost. It's in a, a non-drinkable formula, or it's salty. It's it's either salt water or it's frozen, so it's not drinkable. Fresh water, that is to say, water that can be dr- can be drunk for human existence, is like five percent of the total, and It's precious. Just look at Earthrise, that wonderful photo、uh, where the Mariner、uh, Apollo, the Apollo mission, Apollo 8, I believe, came around the, the moon on the fourth go round, the fourth orbit of the moon. The Earth, from the perspective of the spacecraft coming around, orbiting the moon, the Earth was rising the way we see the moon rise. That famous photo, I think. Let me see if I can dig it up here. Earthrise, do I have it on my? Let's see here. Earthrise photos, indeed I do. Uh huh. Okay, there's there it is right there. Let me share my screen. Here it is. And notice that Australia is featured here, <laughs> or is that South America? I can't tell. Maybe you can tell.、But、there it is. That blue, that's the water. And if you look past the Earth out into space, how many other celestial bodies do you see that have water, drinkable, livable, climate that isn't like Mars that's just so dry, so hot? Not many, very few. Maybe you could say none that we know of. There we go. Check that one. How about that? So, 事故此处最吉祥 Therefore, this place is the most auspicious. So, we're dropping our bar. We're saying life supporting. It's auspicious because you can you can inhabit it. You can go live there.、Um, however, however, golly, I remember、um, there was a. a The Parliament of World's Religions、uh, in Melbourne. Here it was '96, was it?、Uh, no, 2006, I believe.、Um, one of those Parliament of World's Religions had a a tremendous exhibit put out. Again, somebody can correct me. I think I'll get this not accurate, but a、uh, a museum. Uh, researchers in a museum, and if I'm not mistaken, it was Chicago,、uh, brought an exhibit for everyone to appreciate at the Parliament, and it was a walk through time. 
uh, using the planet as the being that we're, we're watching grow. And this state for planet Earth is only the last bit of its life so far. Uh, there was large portions of planet Earth's life when we couldn't have lived there because it was a mass of fire or it was covered in ice or it was uh, just a blend of the two, you know. So humanity, our species, has been on planet Earth if it was a 12-hour clock, think of a clock face and the hands going around, we are, our species, this, this human animal, uh, primate, has been on the planet for the last 30 seconds of a minute, something like that, half of a minute. We've been here, if, if all of the Earth's lifespan to date. So we take it for granted and we waste water as if it was always going to be here, when in fact the presence of water in our lives is just too special, too rare, right? Okay, this is, uh, yeah, this is the one from Apollo. That was the famous first one that was published in Life magazine and everybody went, whoa, look at that. So how rare and special, how auspicious. Qi Xiang, we should just praise creation, however, you, whatever story you want to tell about creation, that we happen to be on this planet when there is water, drinkable, and think about our children and our children's children. We have a child among us today, a young lady who, you know, we may have to, in her lifetime, she may have to treat water like we treat oil and diamonds now. Just so valuable, you know. Here in Australia, turn the tap, drink, it's good. Some days it tastes a little more fluoride than others, but tap water is perfectly fine. What a blessing. There are places on this planet where you do not drink the tap water if you want to stay healthy. So, incredible blessings. And uh, we, you know, wisdom and kindness to our generations to come would suggest that this should be our priority. Not the Dow Jones. You turn on the radio, you know, NPR, my favorite back in the U.S., and every hourly, quarterly uh, newscast gives us the stock. The stock is up or down. And honestly, we can't eat money. The pharaohs of Egypt are buried with their gold. Their lives are over, but their gold remained. <laughs> but they weren't there to claim it. It's not theirs. And, you know, What's the priority? Well, for us, water. So, this place is the most auspicious. This is auspicious because we can live here. And, you know, as a monk, as a Buddhist, I would say because we have the Dharma that we can cultivate and see beyond. See out in to, I want to refocus your vision. Don't look at the blue marble. Look at the black surrounding it and ask yourself, where's the water? Look at the foreground. Do you see the moon, the moon's surface in the foreground of that photo? Where's the water? Uh-uh, nope. So anybody who thinks, well, when this planet gets unlivable, we'll just jump onto a, a SpaceX rocket and go inhabit Mars? No guarantee and only the few can go. So, chi whiz, priorities. So we were pleased to uh, see a new government arrive uh, last night in Australia and the leader said, uh, we will champion our planet. We will 
focus on renewable resources, renewable energy. That's, a, a, that's wisdom at work because this one, the one we're looking at there on the screen, is finite. As they say, there is no planet B. This is it. We have to, if we mess it up, if we blow it, it'll be on our children and our children's children. Changes, changes to come. So, how do you define auspicious is the question. Let's look at the Abhatamsaka Sutra and figure out what our Deva, the Yemo Tianwang, says is auspicious. Are we ready? Here it is. Here we go. Wushang Rulai Chu Chung De Chu Ji Xiang Chung Se Wushang Yi Tsang Ru Tsi Shan Yan Dian Shi Gu Tsi Chu Zi Ji Xiang The Tathagata unsurpassed, replete with every virtue, supreme among what is auspicious, has stayed in this palace of wholesome adornments. Therefore, this place is most auspicious. Okay? So, what's the Buddha's name? Who, this is Buddha number nine that our Deva is saying, I saw him. I was here and I hosted him. Unsurpassed. Wu Sheng. Fu Wu Sheng. Wu Sheng Ru Lai, his name was. Beyond the, the no... Uh, so, Sheng means to be victorious, to win. So, no winner beyond him. He is the winner, winner to Tagata. Replete with every virtue, he has every kind of virtue, every goodness is alive in this person. Um, I was, I remember when I first started uh, dating, it was, <laughs> uh, I had to, uh, meet the, the, the dads of the, the girls I was dating back in high school. This is long, long ago. And the, I was struck, I had this new awareness uh, because the, the girl who I had asked out, I think it was a prom or a school dance or something, she had to introduce me to her dad and she had to find something positive to say about me and think something I was interested in or that I got good grades or that I was in theater or something. And I saw her struggling to, to say something. And I, for the first time, I realized, how am I being judged? What qualities am I known for that put me in a good light? And so you think, if you go to dinner with some friends from your church, friends from your team, family friends who you're, you brought a friend along, how do you introduce them? Say, oh, oh here is, uh, here's Bill. Bill is in marketing. Hmm. Oh, here is, here's Susie. Susie has three kids. Ah, here's Tom. Tom, went, Tom was in Vietnam. Or Tom served in Iraq, you know. And what are the qualities that we use? Job, offspring, military service. How many times have you ever introduced a new friend to your lunch group and said, this is uh, Fred? Fred is really kind. Here is Janice. Janice has a lot of wisdom. Never, right? We never introduce with the interior qualities, the virtues. Why not? Why isn't that something that we're proud of? Here is uh, Rebecca. She never tells a lie. Imagine if that was, if we used virtues, meaning the best part of your heart, the best part of your humanity, as the label by which we would be known among our peers. Isn't that interesting? That was my awareness as I saw my, my date try to introduce me to her dad so that her dad would, would uh, you know, 
rest, rest easy, knowing his daughter was on a date with this guy. So, uh, the inner qualities that, that the Buddha here, he is, what, how does it go? It says, he is replete with every virtue, replete with every virtue. If, um, if we use this as our standard and said, ah, oh, here's a, I'd like you to meet uh, Bhikshuni uh, Hung so-and-so. She never gossips. I had a chance to tell that story this week at the interfaith gathering. Uh, there, it was, uh, I was talking with my uh, Muslim friend Afshin from Afghanistan and uh, Afshin was talking about Ramadan, the fast, fasting. And the, I don't know if, if anybody uh, has ever tried it. Muslim, Muslims, of course, do Ramadan if they're practicing. And my uh, role model, Charles Gibbs, uh, a, an, an Episcopal minister, a priest, a priest of the Episcopal Church, has fasted along with Muslim friends during Ramadan. How about that? It's something, talk about spiritual practice, to just not eat or drink during the day. Amazing what they do. So Afshin was telling me about this. He said, I, uh, I, don't, I don't advertise that I'm fasting when I'm out at, at work or talking to non-Muslim friends. Uh, if they ask about it, I talk about it, but I don't say I'm fasting. You know, I don't, I don't display my virtue that way. But he said the best part about it is, of course, the, the feeling of lightness and the, the, uh, the sense that you're you're closer to, to the spiritual. You're closer to the holy uh, because you're cleaner not eating, which is true if you fast. But he said it's, its effect on everything else that you're doing. When you are not digesting food and you're not thinking about lunch or dinner, it puts a spotlight on everything else you do so you're less likely to lie or gossip if you know you're fasting for your spiritual commitment. It just makes your whole life want to go better because you're striving spiritually. I totally understood that. That was so true. It's exactly the same for precept holders in, in the Dharma, in the Buddhist community. If you have taken the precepts or if you've taken refuge, the first step, and then the precepts would be a second step to commitment, a big step, then you know, yeah, I've promised that I'm not going to kill, steal, lust, lie, or drug. And it, when you have an opportunity to do something that is not part of the precepts, like gossip, for example, you don't. Although, strictly speaking, false speech would also include, you know, schism-making, backbiting, carrying tales on people. Chinese say, shi shi fei fei, the rights and the, the yeses and the noes, the rights and the wrongs. You don't do it. So I thought, right on, that it's the effect on all of society when you have a Muslim community that's doing, that's observing Ramadan, powerful. People who, because they, for that month, they are foregoing food during the day, food and drink, no water either, for their spiritual, uh, in, you know, for their spiritual practice. And as a result of that, everything gets upped. Everything gets bumped up a bit. You don't want to, you're feeling better. You're feeling purer. You're feeling closer to, to the holy. So you don't want to cheat. You don't want, you don't, your language, you don't use profanity as much because you feel purer, you don't want to defile it. What an impact that has on society as a whole. I'm, I'm really impressed. I've, as someone who has done some fasting and uh, know how hard it is to do that. And yet, uh, I remember the uh, University of California basketball team had a Muslim uh, basketball player. He was uh, one of the students on the team. 
And he fasted during Ramadan. Ramadan came during the, the playoff season. He went ahead and didn't eat or drink and still took the court and played. And how, you know, you want to drink, you're sweating a lot. He kept his Ramadan observance and still managed to be a varsity basketball player. How hard is that? So real commitment. And the, the impact on society as a whole of one individual who is striving, trying hard to improve the quality of his or her life just because it's the right thing to do, those waves, those ripples go out to the world. And uh, Master Hua would say that it keeps the earth turning. It keeps the, the Dharma realm intact. If one, you know, what would often say, the Sharangama mantra is a similar situation where if there's one person in the world who can recite the Sharangama mantra with a whole heart, from memory ideally, that's one day that negative forces in the universe will still be held back. So if someone for the purpose, for their vows, I vow to observe Ramadan, right? Now, I was talking about Muslim friends, but when I was growing up, my Catholic friends observed fish on Fridays. They didn't eat meat on Fridays. And it was a, a renunciation. It was based on their spiritual commitment. I don't know if, I don't, I haven't heard so much recently whether uh, adopting your diet on Friday as a Catholic is still a big practice. I don't know. When I was growing up, uh, the Brown family, Mike Brown, one of my neighborhood buddies, a uh, Catholic family, he carried, you know, fish sandwiches to lunch, to school, in his lunchbox. Uh, not lunch meat, not bologna, or whatever it was. There's tuna fish. And, because he was Catholic. And it was, there were big fish fries all over the state of Wisconsin, wherever there were Catholics, uh, on Fridays. And it was special. It was different. Um, Protestants had the month of Lent. And depending on your, uh, your commitment, you would observe that or not. So, interesting, huh? The impact on one person who says, mm, I have a material body and appetites and things I like to eat, but I also have a spiritual commitment. I have an identity that it goes beyond the body. It has to do with the thing inside whatever you call it, my Buddha nature. Because of that, I change my behavior a little bit. And it's inconvenient, it's mm, hard sometimes, it's, quote, unpopular. You say, no, I don't drink alcoholic beverages. I have been meditating, and the insight that I gain from being clean and sober uh, Money can't buy it. So uh, I'll have a near beer. I'll have a, an orange crush. I'll have a seltzer water. Give me a root beer instead, a ginger beer, instead of anything alcoholic. That, you, you become known as a wallflower. No fun. And yet, when, when the, the partiers are hung over the next day and they see you, driving them home safely the night before, they are so glad that you are a wallflower. So what a difference. Yeah, yeah. Okay, you got it. That's what is auspicious. What makes it auspicious? The practices of the people in the place make it auspicious. So, and the practices of the Buddha are sublime. Ready? Ku Xing Ru Lai Li Shi Jian Chu Ji Shang Zhong Zi Wu Shang Bi Tseng Ru Tsi Pu Yan Dian 
，是故此处最吉祥。The Tathagata ascetic, benefiting the world, supreme among what is auspicious, has stayed in this palace of encompassing adornments. Therefore, this place is most auspicious. What about that? Look at that. These two words here, ku heng, ku xing. Sometimes those two words right there. The Buddha's name is bitter practice. Ooh, who wants that? Bitter. Ugh. We want sweet, unless you like bitter. Maybe you're somebody who goes for Vegemite, Vegemite on bread. No. Yes. No. Any Vegemite eaters here? No. 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 Yes. Okay, good. Ah, me too. Yeah. Okay, there are two of us here. Everybody else is like, don't ask me. My, my. Yeah. Oh, Vegemite. In England, it's Marmite. In in Australia, it's Vegemite. Is she a Vegemite eater? She's really good on buttered toast. Ooh. So、uh, bitter, and some people. You know what we have? We have、uh, in in the Chinese tea drinking world,、uh, oolong oolong cha is really bitter,、uh, and oolong tea, and yet there's something special about that bitterness that they say the hui in the 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 flavor after the bitterness goes is. Sweet.、Uh, so, what about this this word, ascetic? The Buddha's name is ascetic, and ku xing, bitter practice. What an interesting concept. Master Xuanhua、uh, is known as the monk who really, really investigated bitter practice because of his vows,、uh, as A young man, he started bowing, and he bowed for hours a day. At age ten, bowed to thank his parents for bringing him into the world. His parents didn't ask him to. They said, "What are you doing? Don't do that. Don't bow to us." So he went out in the backyard and bowed quietly on his own, on behalf of his parents, and. He bowed to the teacher that he would meet in the future. He, he was ten years old. He was a kid, but he wanted to get busy with practices because he had these some sense of destiny in his heart that was going to carry him in that direction. He was a remarkable child, and then,、um, as a teenager, the the、uh, Japanese invaded. His hometown, all of Manchuria, but they were in his hometown in particular, and he saw lots of suffering、uh, because of the war, and he saw people without enough food and without any protection against the elements. So he took vows that he would eat one meal a day. He was a strapping young man, tall and strong, and he could eat three bowls of rice three three times a day. And he said, "I will not consume breakfast and dinner, six bowls of food,、uh, six bowls of rice, so that it'll still be in the in the world. While I don't, I'm not able to directly give it to my compatriots.、Uh, at least I didn't consume it indirectly. I'm dedicating it to them. And so from that time on, as a teenager, he was eating one meal a day." And he found in the Buddha's sutra the forty-two sections. Sutra Ar Jangjing is a classic,、uh, a text called the Sutra of Forty-Two Sections,、um, where the Buddha talks about eating one meal a day at noon in midday. So the Master Hua said, "I will."、Uh, his name at then he wasn't Master Hua. He was Bai. His surname is from the Bai family. And、uh, so young Master Bai.、Uh, Said, I like the Buddha. I will honor the Buddha's practice and eat one meal a day at noon. And he also said,、um, because I see my compatriots shivering in the extremes of Manchurian 
winter. If you want a comparison, uh, northern Maine, people who know the state of Maine, uh, in, in this country here in Australia, it's Melbourne. Just compare it to Melbourne. Uh, cold. Uh, Maine is, sticks way up in the northeast, like Korea. You know, you has an image of Korea. Manchuria is, is right around the corner from Korea. So very cold in the winter and hot in the summer. Master Hua said, I will wear three layers of cloth only. Same vow. The things that I am not consuming, at least they're still available to be worn. It's a theoretical asceticism. He can't directly take clothes out of his closet and give them to, to people suffering from the cold in prison camps uh, during the war. But he said, at least I'm not using them. So indirectly, the, I'm giving them to people who are suffering. So the, the spirit behind that is really, really admirable. What is it? It's called Dai Ren Shou Ku, right? It's Shu Ji Wei Ren, right? Giving up your own well being on behalf of others. You're willing to take on suffering on others' behalf. That was that spirit of a teenage boy. When I was a teenager, I didn't have that kind of altruism. I wasn't selfless like that. I was interested in what benefited me and my, the people around me, my family and my friends. I wasn't thinking about existential suffering that people were going through and how I could take on part of their burden. Really selfless for a young man. So what did he do? He wore, let's see, I've got one layer, two layers. I have three layers on right now. I've got, inner, I've got a shirt, a robe, and a, and a t-shirt. And that would be it during the winter and in the winter, it drops way below zero. Master Hua did that uh, for years. And that is uh, hard to do. We, we have a monk in our community who determined that he was going to do what Shifu did, wear three robes, three layers of cloth through the winter. Where? Burlingame, California. That's in the Bay Area, on the peninsula, not far from the San Francisco International Airport. Not so cold there, although on that peninsula, it can get down to uh, Fahrenheit, like 40, which was, I guess, three or six, maybe here Celsius, something like that. Um, it can get pretty cold in the peninsula. And in the building, in the monastery, it's always colder inside than it is outside, one of the qualities of a monastery. So I won't give his name, but our monk determined he was going to do that one winter. And we watched him uh, with three layers of cotton cloth. His nose was always running. He had to like have a, rich, first it started out as Kleenexes, you know, he's going to have a tissue there, but the tissue didn't do it. He needed to have a, a cloth because his, he was constantly running with snot and mucus. And he was coughing and sick and he, de he was tough. He determined he was going to do it, but he really suffered. And he said, I can't sustain it. I need to wear more clothes. I don't have Master Hua's strength to be able to do it, even in Northern California. How much the less in Manchuria, which is, has extremes of hot and cold. So that was his vow. That's ascetic. Master Hua got, was known as Ku Xingsang the monk who really fulfilled asceticism. Now, let's take a look. When we say ascetic, what are we talking about? The Buddha outlined practices that were wholesome asceticism and practices that were considered unbeneficial. Dutanga is a Sanskrit word that that we say doso in Chinese, ku uh, hung, to shake up, to invigorate, to get you moving. That's the list of practices that the Buddha said are acceptable. And they focus on daily practices, clothes, food, and sleep or rest. 
That's what the Dutangas are about. There are 13. One is called, you wear, it's the practice of wearing rags. Robes made from discarded or soiled cloth. Um, if householders give you nice woolen robes, you don't accept them. Instead, you go around, you look for uh, discarded cloth. Uh, back in the Buddhist time, the uh, uh, there dumps were there was no you know dump truck that whisked away refuse and garbage. People would throw stuff away in a heap in a pile, and. Uh, so if there were clothes, if there was cloth out there available, uh, the monks would take that, clean it up, wash it, stitch it together, cut, cut it to fit, and that would be their robe. Now, where was cloth readily available? Charnel grounds, fanmu cham. India, where bodies are burned, cremated out in public, in, not in public, in a, they're, they're cremated in the charnel ground, not in a crematorium. That's where cloth was available. So cloth that had been worn by a dead body. Everybody else goes, I don't want that. The monk would go, okay, I am going to practice Cushing. I'm going to make my robes out of this. You take it, wash it, stitch it together, and that would be it. You can see my robe here is made of uh, you can't see very well. It's made of patches. There's one long and one short, and they're stitched together. This is a nine-piece robe, and if I were to take it off and hold it up, you could see the, the robe that monks wear, the three robes that we wear, are still designed from the patchworked, patchwork cloak that monks have always worn in the Buddhist Sangha. So that's the first of the Dutanga practices, is you wear robes that are made up of rags. Number two has to do with clothes. It's called triple robe wearer. You make a vow. You practice wearing only three robes. Who did that? Master Hua interpreted as three layers of cloth. He was not a monk at that time, uh, but he, he patterned it after the Dutanga practice. So when we ordain as monks or nuns, we get three robes. Uh, and they're, they're these, the, the kashaya, this outer robe. That's the, the three robes. So if you only wear those, that is an ascetic practice. Okay, so those are two that have to do with robes. Let's look at number three. We're going to launch into food practices, ascetic practices based on food. Alms food eater practice. You only eat the food that is offered when you're on an alms round. So you will not accept food that comes to the monastery where you're living. If, you don't, if it's not put in your bowl, you won't eat it. Okay? So, you only eat alms food. Huh. Interesting. We in America, we Han Chuan Fo Jiao, Mahayana monks, can't follow that practice yet. Why? We don't do alms rounds. We might in the future. It's very possible that we will do that in the future. Who does it? The Thai forest tradition monks, the monks in Ajahn Chah's lineage. Uh, in, uh, we, we, I told this story before, um, how the city of 10,000 Buddhas up in Talmadge near Ukiah, California, arrived there in 1976. That's when the property became ours. And we uh, don't in, in the Chinese tradition, we don't go house to house or building to building with big alms bowls receiving people's kind donations. We don't do that. Who does it? Well, the Abayagiri monks from the Thai forest tradition, disciples of Ajahn Cha and Ajahn Sumedho, uh, led by Ajahn Pasano and Ajahn Amaro at the time, 
they arrived in 1996 when they first started going. Within the first year, those monks would show up in the town of Ukiah or the town of Redwood Valley, which is closer where they live, with their alms bowls. And the, they'd walk down the street, down Main Street, in their robes with their alms bowls, smiling and looking happy and friendly, not talking, not accepting money, but people would say, what are you doing here? And the, the speaker, designated speaker, would say, we're, we're here. We are making ourselves available should you practice, should you want to practice generosity. If you want to be generous, we're here to accept anything that you'd like to offer that doesn't break our precepts. We don't touch money. People go, oh, really? Oh, that's so interesting. Uh, Bob, bread, there's a bakery. They run over to the bakery, take a loaf of bread, put it in the oven. The monks would chant for them and then take the food back and, and eat it. And of course, it wasn't, it wasn't enough to sustain the lives of the monks, but it was a start. And after one week of seeing the monks and after 10 weeks of seeing the monks and after 52 weeks of seeing the monks, on Thursdays, walking the streets of Ukiah, people would go, oh, oh, here they come, here they come. I uh, got some special honey and I baked some bread for them. And, uh, and you know, it's like, it became something that was part of the culture. And now the, the monks are requested to go, please go here, please go there, to receive alms. It's, they have made it part of the scene in Mendocino County, there are Buddhist monks on alms rounds, and you can make an offering if you choose to practice generosity for them. So, <laughs> so we were uh, sharing a lecture one day. Uh, actually, I had been uh, invited to Abagiri for lunch, and it was time to, to speak a little bit, and uh, Ajahn Pasano said, well, he said, we have a hung shur here from City of 10,000 Buddhas, and of course our connections with them are very, in fact, this land that we're on was donated by Master Hua to us, to Ajahn Sumedho, and uh, so he said, we'd like to ask hung shur to speak. So I said, um, well, thank you so much, this is very nice. Uh, yes, uh, it is true. Um, we are learning a lot from our Theravada brothers. And you know, Master Hua said that receiving alms from lay people is a Buddhist practice, just like wearing the robe. We insist on keeping our robes on the way the Theravada monks do. And at some point in America or Australia, where the monks have come, it will be important to return to our practice of alms rounds. This is clearly the way the Buddha set up his Sangha. And so here I was describing this, and I said, we see our Theravada brothers in Ukiah already, it's become a custom. We were here so many years, 20 years earlier, and we've never done it. And, and but we're gonna do it someday. Ajahn Pasano said, uh-huh. He said, yeah, you could start. He said, you know, the lay people these days, they line up on Main Street with the food all ready to put in our bowls. And most of those lay people come from city of 10,000 Buddhas, he said. <laughs> and we're like, well, <laughs> it's just that we're lazy, we haven't done it. Yeah, so the foundation is there. One of these days we will. It's really a wonderful practice. I have done it in Thailand with uh, Theravada monks. I've taken my shoes off, become a tenderfoot walking over the trails the Thai, the, the Thai forest monks who do it every day, their, their feet, the leather, the, the soles of their feet are like leather, like shoe leather. They can walk on all the rocks. And I'm there with my tender feet and ooh, 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 walking over the rocks, you know. Come on, Bante, we'll get you there. So we get into the village and here's the family. And here's the dad, here's the mom. Mom's got a baby in her arms. And here's the, the children, the stair steps. And there's the dogs barking and... Grandma is smiling out the door, and the, the monks come in line, and there's a whole technique. You just lift the lid of the bowl correctly, 
and you don't talk. The monks don't talk. And you come up in line, lift the lid of the bowl, and the dad is holding a silver-plated uh, rice bowl, which is specially for offering to monks. And he takes a spoon, a rice paddle, and puts some rice in your bowl, and then hands it to the mom, and the mom takes the rice paddle and puts it in the hands of the baby. And the baby might be even like nine months, just a brand new kid who is touching this rice paddle, and mom dips into the silver bowl with some rice and the baby's hand on the paddle and puts it in the monk's bowl. So at age nine months, this child has had the experience of feeding the monks. And then the kids do it on down, and you cover the bowl and you move on the second monk. Same pattern, right? So the, the lay people say, any day that begins with making an offering to the Sangha is a day that had a good start. So this is, you know, it's this generosity and being given to, the joy of being what's called a field of blessings, Fu Tian Zeng that makes this exchange so rich and so deep. So, and it's been, this has been on the planet for 2,500 years, it's been doing this, that the Sangha has been receiving offerings. So, how wonderful. Um, now, there we are. That's the, you only eat alms food. The next one is, uh, house to house, seekers practice. You don't omit any house while you go for alms. You don't choose to go only to the rich households or as one of the Buddha's disciples only went to poor households to let them uh, create more blessings. Neither one. You go to, uh, sometimes it was seven houses and you only ate what you got. You got a lot, you ate, that was what you ate. You could share it, you got a little, that's what you ate. Bitter, suppose nobody's there. Suppose the houses were not Buddhist houses. <laughs> yeah, so that's bitter. And the, uh, the Buddha didn't recommend it, uh, but there were two monks who were competing to see who could be more ascetic looking for the Buddha's praise, I only go to poor houses, I only go to rich houses. So, so, yeah, if you only go to rich houses, you figure you get more, but not for sure. Right? So, okay, next one. Also food, the one session practice. You eat one meal a day and refuse other food offered before midday. It's understood that in this tradition, you stop eating at noon. So, one meal a day, that's the way the Sangha, admiring Master Hua's selflessness, that's a practice that we've adopted. And many people uh, can't imagine how that would work. I will say that this description, let me show it here. This description leaves out an important part of how this practice works, which is, you know, when we first showed up at Gold Mountain Monastery, it was the 70s. And the Sangha, who had left home voluntarily, ate one meal a day at noon, following our teacher, who was following the Buddha. And we were, mind you, eating, uh, we never spent money on food. We were eating food that came out of the dumpster behind Safeway. Master Hua's comment was, in this country, people waste too much food. Monks shouldn't 
indulge, shou, we shouldn't in, enjoy our blessings. He said, Shouku Shuliaoku, Xiang Fu Shu Xiao Fu. He said, If you can endure a bit of hardship, if you can renounce, your real hardship is done. It you're emptying out that bank account of difficulty, your bad karma. Shouku Shuliaoku. If you can endure suffering, it ends. Suffering ends. But if you Xiangfu Shu Shaofu, if you enjoy your blessings, you exhaust your blessings. So, he said, monks, you're not doing any other contribution to society per se. You're not paying taxes, uh, and yet you still enjoy the utilities and all. So you can catch, you can thrive on the food that others overlook or discard or throw away, he said. So that was the way we did it. We went to the supermarkets in San Francisco and found food that was discarded. Day-old bread, people don't want it by the second day. The bananas have some brown spots, perfectly good. In fact, luxurious, but not saleable on you know, by the standards of A&P or Safeway or Albertsons or whatever. So we did well. And we ate one meal a day. So that was the way it went. But, as I say, the part that's missing here is that at night, when you would think if you didn't eat dinner ever, you stopped eating at noon, you'd be hungry at night, right? Well, we sat in Shurfu's Dharma lectures, his sutra lectures at night. And you know, every day at lunch in mid the Sangha, when we, when we sit in the community, with the community, and do our prayers before our, our meal blessing, we say, Chan Yue Wei Shi Fa Shi Chong Man. We take the, the the bliss of dhyana as our food, and we're filled with the joy of dharma. Chan yue wei shi fa shi chong man. The bliss of dhyana, sitting in meditation, generates this feeling of physical well-being. Oh my goodness. You feel at one like never before. You feel like you're more yourself than you've ever been. You are together. You're united because your body and your mind and your spirit and your energy is all circulating. You feel light and balanced and centered and your six senses are refreshed and recharged, kind of like you're plugged into the universe when you're meditating. And it's renewing. You just, yeah, you, you don't feel full. You're not see, thinking, oh man, I really would love, you know, mm, I would love a, a soy latte with a double shot and, you know, uh -uh. and feeling, you know, Namo da fang guang fo hui and jing hui and hai wei fo pu That light that comes in when you're inviting the, the three jewels, it filled you up like food. You weren't hungry. When you finished with that sutra lecture, you really felt radiant. You felt clean and fresh. There wasn't a sense of, got to go out and get a steak. I really could use some fried chicken, you know. How about some ribs with barbecue sauce? Uh-uh, didn't, didn't feel that way. So, the, in the monastery, the eating once a day was supplanted, was nourished, was supplemented, that is, supplemented is the word, by hearing the sutras, hearing the dharma. Made a big difference. Okay, we have one more food practice to go here. These ascetic practices, golly. Dutanga. Bowl eaters practice. Eating food from a bowl which is mixed together rather than from plates and dishes. Uh-uh. Uh, that's, uh, that's not the way we interpret it. This, this version of it uh, is one bowl. 
It's not that your bowl is mixed together rather than from plates and dishes. That doesn't make sense. It's the chi bo fan, it's called. You eat one bowl, yi bo, and you don't eat a second bowl. That, Master Hua said, don't do that. He said, some days you want less, some days you want more. If you go hungry because you didn't get your fill because your, your practice got in the way, that becomes affliction. It's wu yi ku hung. That's unbeneficial ascetic practice. Okay, here's one. Later food refusers, you don't take any more after you are satisfied. You say, bala, chir bala, I'm, you know, full. And Master Hua would say, eat ba fun ba, eight parts full. Don't stuff your stomach. Uh, that is hard to digest. You need to leave a little bit of space for the, for the factory to do its work. So he said, this one is what happens when, now this is interesting because these Dutanga practices were outlined, these 13 traditional practices were outlined at a time when what? At a time when laity and the monks and nuns were closely related every day at alms time. As I describe the Thai village, you're standing there in line and the lay people are right there at arms putting food in your bowl. You don't touch. That's important that they don't bump you and all. You just keep a distance, but you're right there. And the Thai village, because of the way the kitchens are arranged, the monks stay in file in the street. What I understand about how it was done in the Buddhist time was monks would go into a family compound. Often you go through a gate and the kitchen would be around back. And so that you would go into the family quarters to receive alms. And uh, we, had the, uh, we had the opportunity to um, go on alms rounds in White Salmon, Washington, uh, along with uh, Ajahn Sudanto, who was setting up the uh, uh, Pacific Hermitage up in, with a branch of Abayagiri, up in the north, right where the Columbia River cuts between Oregon and Washington. Little town called White Salmon, and Ajahn Sudanto and other bhikshus from, other bhikkhus from Abayagiri we're setting up, the, uh, setting up the monastery there. And sure enough, from the very beginnings, they went on alms rounds. In the snow, they would go on alms rounds. In the rain, they would go on alms rounds. And the people in the small towns go like, look at these monks. God, they're, they're, they're tough, they're good. We, what can we do, what can we offer them? So we visited and went on alms rounds and uh, went into the house of one of the, the local residents who got to know the monks and the, the house, there were two kids. There was a, a son and a daughter, boy and a girl. And when, uh, when we uh, went in, they were, they said, oh, here's Ajahn Sanato. Mom, the monks are here. And they went into the refrigerator and opened up and brought out the monks bowl that had been in the refrigerator with garden vegetables that they had chopped up especially for the monks and they dropped them into the bowl. So my point in telling this story is that you actually get into the lives of the donors of the, the laity and see how they live and they welcome you into their home. Of course that, you, that could be potentially compromising if you're on, on your own. So monks don't go in on their own. They go in together, but uh, they don't, less gossip that way, just much less trouble. There's no room for stories about so and so, blah, 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 blah. So, in this, in this situation, if you have finished your meal and somebody comes running and says, oh, Bante, I baked some brownies, just one for you, just one. If you are practicing the no further late eating practice, 
then you would say, you say, later food refuser. You say, no, I'm, I'm full. I've received the alms. I will happily take it and bring it back to the monastery and put it in the kitchen for tomorrow. Or uh, there are more monks to come. Please offer it to them. Something like that. So, yeah. But um, interesting. So if, if a Chinese Mahayana monk is hearing this, I'm sure they're going, don't have this experience, haven't done this before. Why? Think about it. Where do you find Chinese monasteries? Out in the mountains. They say all the best monasteries are already taken by the Buddhists and the Taoists. All the best mountains, they say, are already taken by the Buddhists and the Taoists. Throughout China, if you've got a beautiful scenic mountain, there's a real good chance there's a number of monasteries on it. So if the monastery is out in the mountains, what, you know, here we go, there we go. If the monastery is out in the mountains, the monks can't go down with their alms bowls to the deer and the rabbits and the squirrels. There's no houses to, to go on alms rounds for. So the custom began that the lay people on holidays, or on the first and the 15th of the month would take a big bag of rice and a big jug of oil and walk up to the mountain and give it to the, the monk in charge of the stores or the, the kitchen department and they would offer in bulk and then the sangha would apportion it out every day. They would uh, cook from the stash that was offered first and 15th, doing away with the alms round. So you think, oh, well, kind of geographical necessity. Monasteries way out there in the mountains. They can't go on alms rounds. Well, what do we do? So the monks would grow their vegetables in a garden, uh, but the bulk of the, the staples, the starches and the, the rice and such, the noodles, would have to come out in big bulk periodically. So the alms round was just ignored, forgotten. And... So that chance to do kuxing was also unavailable to the monks. So Master Hua was one who revised the, the practice of kuxing. Okay, so that's the food. We got the clothes, the food, look at the dwelling. Forest dweller, you live not in a town, not in a village, but way out. Uh, they say if you can smell industry or cooking fires, too close. Further, if you can hear conversations or musical instruments or horns honking, too close. Go out further. So that's the Aranya. You live in a secluded place. Number two for, clothes, for dwelling is you live among the roots of trees. You don't even want any kind of roof, right? You live outdoors. You really do live outdoors. Among the tree roots. If you have never seen a tree big enough to have roots, this won't make any sense. But, hmm, there are trees here in Australia that have magnificent roots. Uh, you, if you've been in a, in a primal forest, first growth, original forest, and see how this would be possible. And living under tree roots, find the right tree. Um, the, the story was though, inside of this was, you can't stay under the same tree root for more than three nights. And why not? It's not what you think. What's, why would it be the case that you would want to, why, why would the Buddha say, only, only three nights. I didn't show that. Let's show that one here. Here it is. Living, first is living in the forest. Second is living in the roots of a tree. Why would that further get tweaked so that you couldn't do more than three nights? The reason being, if you say, I'm going to live in seclusion and you're out there for three nights, People show up to make offerings. 
you're bothered. Your seclusion is disturbed by the people who go, oh, did you hear that so-and-so Bante is, he's out there, let's go make offerings to the ascetic monk. There must be a lot of blessings available. And people start showing up and pretty soon you got a refrigerator, next you got a Winnebago, you know, Wi-Fi, somebody offers you a phone. Oh, you forget to cultivate. So, yep. What's next? Oh, look at this. Open air dwelling. You don't want a tree. No roof, no tree. Oh, so you only use your robes. That's bitter. There are Theravada monks, I know, in the Thai forest tradition, who only use their samgati, their heavy robe, at night. They that's their, their bedding. They endure the cold. They're living, they can live indoors, but they practice the spirit of the open air dweller by covering themselves with no bedding, only a robe. Look at this one. Charnel ground dwellers practice. You live in a cemetery, live in a graveyard. This is hard, especially because in a first world country, you will be arrested. You hop over the fence and live in a cemetery. The overseer is going to have the police on you quick. Can't do it. It's just not, we've had people talk about this. If you live in a country where graveyards are not supervised, then It's okay. You won't be bothered. Most people don't hang out in cemeteries. You'll be alone. Um, But it's still tricky because why? People have all kinds of views about their deceased relatives. They may not want you living around the graves of their ancestors. Also, Ghosts. Mm. What's the, what do you think when you hear graveyard? Scary. Scary. That's where, you know, it's yinny, it's dark. Vampires, zombies, we think, right? There's lots of, you know, uh, Night of the Living Dead. Ooh, Night of the Living Dead begins in a graveyard. So, one of the scariest films. So, if you, as an ascetic, who is saying, I am here to cross living beings over, my job is to to work with the souls of the departed, I hope there are some ghosts there whom I can recite for. I will recite the Wang Sheng Zhou, Namo Ami Do Po Ye Do To Che Do Ye. On behalf of all the spirits and ghosts in that cemetery, I may not get a lot of sleep, but I will recite for those spirits. And good for you, you got it. That's the spirit, you know. So, sleeping in a graveyard is considered to be an ascetic practice. Check the local laws. Chances are you will be considered a trespasser if you live in a graveyard. Any bad user practice, satisfied in the dwelling a lot of the sleeping place, I uh, don't know about that one. That's a new one. Um, s- sleeping, sitting up, sitter's practice. That is one that began at uh, Buddhist lecture hall in San Francisco and got picked up by the monks at Gold Mountain, monks and nuns. They, the Buddhist lecture hall was so small, the former Tian Ho Miao in Chinatown, San Francisco, the oldest temple in America, uh, disputably, some people have, say there are others in the gold rush era, area that are older, but urban, the oldest temple in Chinatown is Tian Ho Miao. Master Hua came into possession of it for Buddhist lecture hall, and the monks and nuns came there. That was where the first five monastics in America were trained, was Buddhist lecture hall, Fo Jiao Jiang Tang. And it's the top of the fourth floor, a fourth floor building. You could get out on the roof, 
And so monks said, uh, Shurfu, there's this ascetic practice of sleeping sitting up. Can we do it? Shurfu said, you Americans will try anything, huh? Okay, sure, why not? Go ahead. So they built these sitting boxes that you could only cross your legs in and uh, uh, sit up all night, and it became a practice. And so uh, monks and nuns practiced not lying down. And it's hard. It's a hard one. Uh, I was, I guess you could say, unsuccessful after 25 years of attempting to get this right. Uh, I wound up with a crooked back and being scolded by Shurfu for teaching everybody how to do it wrong, he said. <laughs> why did you do that, he said. Shurfu? Oh, why did you tell everybody to do it wrong? Oh, but, but, but Shurfu. So it's, this is an issue, is what? Um, I, I'm going to show you these I'm going, to make, I'm going to pause on that point. Hold that thought. Watch this space. Monks on alms rounds are not begging. And people who say, oh, the monks brought their begging bowls, that's inaccurate. Monks and nuns don't ask for things. Please give me, or I want, those words are not in the vocabulary of a cultivating monk. We don't solicit. So if you say begging bowl, we want to hear. Take a look here. Begging bowl, that is a no. No such thing. Monks don't beg. What do we have instead? We have alms bowls. We are mendicants. Mendicants with their alms bowls. Alms bowls says what? I am making myself available if you would like to practice generosity. So it's on the donor. It's not on the monk. The monk is not saying, please give me more of that chocolate cake. I like that a lot. You know, I like three sugars in my soy latte. No, they don't. If you would like to offer, and it doesn't break the precepts, the monk would be happy to Accept it, okay? So, there we go. All right, Je you've just heard uh, actually more than 13 Dutanga practices and how they were introduced to our Sangha by our teacher who was famous for a monk who adopted ascetic practices and how they, how they actually took root and what didn't, why some of those 13 are considered inappropriate. The idea of ascetic practices is to put you closer to the reality of being alive in your body. How many folks have had the experience of it's dinner time, but somehow you're not quite hungry, and you feel like I should eat something, but I open the refrigerator and nothing looks quite, and it's like, yeah, I ate it, but I, I just, I was, you know, listening to a podcast when I ate because, well, I, I, eating has kind of lost its joy anymore. Yeah, had that feeling, or, awake early in the morning and you're not rested but you're not sleepy either and you just you look at your closet and you have so many clothes but none of them please you so affairs of the body food clothes and sleep can get very blah ordinary and life seems kind of monotonous and meaningless dutanga practices go right there Monastics, and disciples of the Buddha, lay people or monastics alike, are looking into the question, who am I? What is this, this gadget? Who is inside it? Who's alive inside? And how do I step in to being alive? One obvious way is focus on your breath. Oh yeah, that's right. 
I've been doing that all day. Wow, yeah, yeah, breathing, huh? I, suddenly I'm aware, of, wow, I've, I've been breathing all day, haven't I, all my life? Yeah, that's pretty amazing, isn't it? Or there's another practice that's famous in Zen and Buddhist groups is you take something like a raisin, in Australia known as a sultana, or just a chunk of apple, but just take a raisin, a little dried grape, and you close your eyes, and you smell it, and you feel it, and you hold it in your palm, and then you put it on your tongue, and you wait, and this sweetness, wah, fills, you know, and then the, the saliva and the, the raisin interact, and suddenly you're just aware you have this grape in your mouth, and you say, wow, the sun that created this, and the water that nourished it, and one little dried grape, a raisin, sultana, becomes a universe of experience, right? Suddenly food, you realize, oh yeah. So various ways, and one thing to do is to, uh, with sleep, there's all kinds of things you can do with sleep. Um, like sleep with a, a sleep inducer app on your phone. The sounds of water, the sounds of the tide, the sounds of a burning fire, a, a forest, a, a, a campfire you know, the sound of the trees. Play that and watch how sleep changes. So various ways that in the world we can get to the same spirit of the Dutanga practices, which is to make the monk or nun fully aware that every bit of our existence is a gift and is an opportunity. And when we live closer to the bone, so to speak, Every breath, every bite of food, every moment that we're not cold and shivering is a moment to say grateful. It puts us in touch with the reality of our borrowed existence. This thing is dying from our first breath. The number of breaths we're going to take is countable and make the most of being alive in a body, cultivate the way, benefit others. Wei fa wang chu, forget yourself for the Dharma. Shu ji wei ren, forget yourself. Let the self go on behalf of others. The Dutanga practices make that real. Make it a everyday thing. Yes, indeed chance for gratitude. So bitter, so ku ku jin gan lai, is that the phrase? Ku jin gan lai. The Chinese uh, worldly idiom that says, when the bitter is ended, the sweet comes. So flip that over, if you want to be, want to know the sweetness, you should, you have to wait out through the bitter. Lots of ways to illustrate that. So. All righty. Uh, Master Hua said, we really should change the name. We should call bitter practices sweet practices because if you can really endure the bitterness till it's over, then you can be a Buddha. And that's the sweetest of all. You're able to be one with everyone. Okay, that's, let's see. We're going to go over one more time. Ku xing ru lai li shi jian. Shu ji shang zhong, zui wu shang. There we go. Bi cheng ru ci pu yan dian, shi gu ci chu. I'm not doing very well here. Let's bring that forward. Let's do it right. Ku xing ru lai li shi jian, shu ji shang zhong, zui wu shang. Bi cheng ru ci pu yan dian, shi gu ci chu, zui ji shang. The Tathagata ascetic benefiting the world, supreme among what is auspicious, has stayed in this palace of encompassing adornments. Therefore, this place is most auspicious. We will conclude next week. Look, that's it. End of chapter. On to chapter 20 later. But we'll, we'll finish up 
Here's, this, did you see my auspicious place there? There it is. With nature. Auspicious. The rain is falling again. Goodness, here. Um, we, I would like now to invite the monks of Berkeley Monastery to tell us about their three-day Amitabha session coming up. And uh, you want to do that now, Chin Chuan? Sure. Okay, who's there? Chin Chuan, I'm with you, Wisher, here. Okay, Tofo. good. How Amitabha? Great. Okay, there we are. What do you want to tell us? So maybe first, tomorrow morning at 6.30 a.m., we'll have the Great Compassion Mantra Dedication of Merit. We moved it up one week because we have a in Center retreat the following week. So the people who have been joining with us regularly, uh, please join us tomorrow, May 22nd, from 6.30 to 7.30. Okay. Then, so actually, the Amitabha session has already started. Today was our first day. Oh, great. Um, Jim Forsher will share some Dharma. And we recited the Buddha's name. Uh, bathing Buddha we also ceremony. had a bathing Buddha ceremony in the morning. So if you want to continue to be in the session or would like to join us now, you're very much welcome to. Um, tomorrow will also be special because we have an eight precept transmission at 8.30 a.m. Online. Online. So um, you can find the information on the website, which we're sure is showing right now. And if you still would like to put a memorial plaque up, you can still do so. There's a number of places to do it on the website. Yeah. Yep. Okay, you can see the links here. You can do the Bhagavad yeah. Gita. You have to register. Yeah. You can do the Li Pai Wei, and you can do two, and you sign up right there. Yep, so pretty good. Then below that, we just had to finish the Bathing Buddha ceremony. So we have a recording there. People would like to go watch it. Um, but we have a very beautiful... Um, table with flowers and lotuses and so if people want to see that you can okay good yeah um the other one to mention is we have buddha root farm coming up july 8th to the 17th i believe there's still some space so if you would like to join uh, please register as soon as possible um the kind of space is limited but it's a great chance to be close to nature reciting Guan Yin bodhisattva's name name I like to say, returning to our nature in nature. <laughs> right. Yeah. You bet. Um, other than that, we have Dharma Master's Lecture on Friday, which was yesterday mm -hmm. in the afternoon. Chung and mm -hmm. the rest of our kind of BBM programs are starting to have the summer break. So I know Marty's finished his, his lecture series last week. So um, he'll begin again in uh, early September. Early right? September, yeah. Okay. Great. All right. Thank you for that. Glad to hear from you. Yeah. D d do join in the Amitabha session at the Berkeley Monastery online. It's quite a wonderful experience. Um, you'll be together with Dharma friends from all over the world. Uh, <clears throat> I wanted to also let people know if you are a social media user, go to Instagram, Dharma Radio Music. Find Dharma Radio Music, one word, D-H-A-R-M-A-R-A-D-I-O-M-U-S-I-C, Dharma Radio Music, on Instagram. Every now and then, we are publishing stories from Good Karma Music. You're aware of our website, I know, um, where if you do a good deed and tell us what it was, we will send, give you a CD of Dharma music. Um, here is the first one. I took my six-year-old daughter to pick up garbage on the mountain to keep the environment clean. We wish that our small act can bring people a pleasant hiking experience. Cleaning up the mountain is also a cleaning up of our minds, said Bella. Give her choice of music. Also, we want to announce that Father Cyprian Concilio, the prior, that is to say, the abbot of New Camaldoli Benedictine Catholic Hermitage gave, uh, donated three of his beautiful songs 
to rewards for good deeds on Good Karma Music. So go out to Dharma Radio Music and you will be able to record your good deed and take your pick from the music on offer. Now, if you are a Facebook user, and I know not everybody listening can do so, some of us can't get to Facebook, uh, but you go to, here it is, right here, Dharma Radio on Facebook. Um, yeah, just go to Dharma Radio. You can like and read the stories here. There's our first story from Bella. Um, there are other, we had 13 days of Dharma Radio uh, prior to this. So please do, this is a new initiative to get people doing more good deeds and to be more aware of Buddhist music and stories as well. All right, here we go. Great, now it is time to transfer merit. And we're going to, once again, um, we're gonna use Medicine Buddha's mantra as our means for transferring the merit. And I was recently out in, uh, among a, an interfaith group in the evening, about 40 people, and sitting there, uh, I thought, gee whiz, I sure hope nobody is sick, hope, hope nobody's got COVID here. And I remembered, and I thought, oh, here you go. And I went quietly sitting there listening to the talk. I went, Om Namo Bhagavate in my mind, silently. And I felt like there was, not only was I not afraid of getting COVID, I felt like I could contribute something to the group. I felt like this is my chance to send out good energy to the people sitting around me. Using, borrowing Medicine Buddha's uh, vow and his mantra, the, the vibration and the goodness of this, the light. So uh, it was really nice to have this mantra to recite in Sanskrit. And as people have said, having tune the melody helps too. So I can recommend that if we're because of work or school or shopping, we have to go out in a crowd, keep this mantra running. It really gives you something positive to do that keeps the mantra at bay. Here we go. Please make a wish for your merit where you want to send it. Yeah, probably. 
have a handbell. I'm going to ding it and invite you to bow with me to the Buddhas. From right from where you're sitting. Here we go. First bow. Second bow. Third bow. Bow in respect to the Venerable Master. Alrighty, that's going to do it for us for today. We'll see you all next week.